So this last message I like to call, let's end with the beginning in mind. Come on. And uh, so you are going to leave here today. Uh, I work at Christian camp. We never thought about going back. You're different than who you, how many of y'all watch Dragon Ball Z? Any Dragon Ball Z fans? Uh, Dragon Ball Z fans, you know what the hyperbolic time chamber is? If you are an older Dragon Ball Z fan, it was called the Realm of Spirit and Time. Uh, inside the chamber, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Dragon Ball Z, inside the chamber where you train, uh, one year goes by inside the chamber as one day goes by outside the chamber. And so for a lot of other people, it's just been a weekend, right? The beauty for you is that over this retreat, you've made decisions. You have grown way more than three days' work. Come on. But when you return home today, we say you go forward home because you ain't going back nowhere. You're going forward because you are slightly different than you were when you left. At least that's the hope. Yeah. But to everybody else, it's just been a weekend. And so when you get home, it was just a Sunday morning, just like any other Sunday morning. But to you, you've experienced some things that there may be no context for when you get home. Almost like the Mount of Transfiguration or like the text we're about to read. I want to set up, set it up for you. I'm going to read the text and I'm going to pray. Set it up for you. Jesus has risen from the dead. Dead people have walked through the streets. They've risen out of their graves and walked through the streets. If you don't believe that, read Matthew 27. Come on. Jesus himself has now appeared to his disciples. And this is the last words that Jesus is communicating to them before he ascends to sit at the right hand of God the Father in majesty on high. Last words are important, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so this is Jesus' last words to his disciples. I'll read them to you. Verse 18. The Bible says Jesus came and he spoke to them saying, All authority or power, depending on the translation, is given to me in heaven and in earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things, whatever I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you forever, even until the end of this age. Amen. Father, I pray that as we sift through this, I pray that we would really end this morning with the beginning in mind, that we would understand that every person in this room needs a Paul or a Naomi to disciple us and exhort us that we might learn how to bring all things in submission to you. Everyone needs a Barnabas or an Elizabeth to come into our lives and encourage us to be truth tellers that will tell us the truth when we need to hear it most, when we'd like to hear it least. I pray that you allow us to understand that all of us need a Timothy, a Ruth, a person that we can equip, a person that we can communicate the things that you have done. I pray most of all that you would do work in my heart. Remind me that the control has been restored in full. That you, through your son Jesus Christ, Father, have won the victory for us, that we might be able to share the truth of what you have done with all of the nations. We love you very much, Lord, and we give you this morning in order that your name might receive all glory and praise. Amen. Amen. All right, here we go. Let's end with the beginning in mind. The question I have for you uh, this morning, there are three things. The first is the control has been restored in full. What do I mean by that? Do you remember in Genesis when I said that the first thing God did is gave Adam a command, and that command was, I mean, the Bible says that God blessed him, and he said to him, be fruitful and multiply. And the next thing he said was, have dominion over the fish and sea, follow the air, over every creeping thing, and over everything, right? He's given him dominion, he's given him rule. When Adam sinned, he gave that up. Check this out. When Jesus restores all things, what is the first thing he tells his disciples when he rises? All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Why is that important? Because Adam legally lost it. Jesus righteously regained it. Yeah. Since Jesus righteously regained it, when God looks at me, like I said last night, God can see a son. Hebrews chapter 2 says, because of the cross of Jesus Christ, his death and his resurrection, Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters if you're female. The coolest thing about this text is that there is no... There is no way for God to, there, there is no way for us to lose authority again because the authority isn't wrapped up in us, it's wrapped up in Jesus. Amen. Now, if that doesn't mean anything to you, that means that you are already looking forward as you go home and go, anybody don't care what I did this weekend. Nobody will even know. You're expecting to go to school on Monday and it'd be just like any other day, but you know that that's not the way it's supposed to be. No different than in the cell saga if Gohan, who could have been Super Saiyan level 2, would have came out and not lived it, his dad would have been completely disappointed because that was his power level. Y'all know him what Goku did. Goku let his power come back a little bit in order that he might see Gohan achieve his destiny. And I'm telling you right now that some of you youth leaders are going to do the same for you. Once you leave this place with the decisions that you've made as you continue to live that out, more responsibility will be given to you. I want to tell y'all something. I'm a big cartoon nut, right? So with great power comes great responsibility, right? 
that was taken from scripture. But Jesus said it this way, to whom much is given, much is required. The truth that you have heard this weekend is a truth that you will be required to communicate Amen. to your friends. Why? Because Jesus already won the victory. Y'all know how we are. I got an iPhone. I bought my iPhone about two years ago. And whenever you get a good app, you just got to tell somebody how good the app is. Y'all know what I'm talking about, especially when it's working for you. Mm -hmm. I'm a big Boxer fan. For those of you who don't know what Boxer is, that's totally cool. But I put it on my iPhone. As soon as I put it on my iPhone, I have to tell everybody, this is the coolest thing in the world. How is it that it's very easy to do that, to talk about the things that we care about most, like Boxer? Mm -hmm. But it's a little bit harder when we talk about the gospel. Mm -hmm. We say that Jesus means more to us than anything else. We say we want that to be the case. And then we keep our mouths shut when we have an opportunity to talk about it. Mm -hmm. But we'll talk about anything else that we love. Side note, I tell every young person I encounter this. If you say Jesus means the most to you and your friends don't care nothing about Jesus, can I tell you that they are not your friends? That's not a good definition. You need to change that definition. If you can talk to them about anything, basketball, whether or not LeBron James or Kobe Bryant or Kevin Durant is the best in the NBA currently, we all know who the greatest was. Just for the fun of it. Kobe. Wow. So... Um, <laughs> Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing how quickly and easily those things can stir up a whole lot of stuff? But when somebody says that Jesus didn't rise from the dead, sometimes we sit back and we keep our mouths shut. There's more proof that Jesus rose from the dead than a lot of other things that we say. But often we don't know that truth because we're not acquainted with it. It's not the thing that we cherish the most. We don't open God's word. We don't even see it as God's word. We feel like, like Bill Cosby said in episode one to Theo when Theo was trying to argue with him about his grades being so bad. We think that if we read the word of God, our brain is going to explode and come oozing out of our ears. We think we can't understand it. Let me free you up. You can't. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that the word of God is only spiritually discerned because it was spiritually written. According to 2 Peter chapter 1, by men of God who were carried along by the Holy Ghost. That means they were inspired by God's Spirit to write the Scriptures. That means if you're to understand the Scriptures, you have to do the same thing with the Scriptures that you have to do with me. If I wrote you a letter and you didn't understand it, you have to come to me and ask, what does this mean? Come on. God is not afraid of that question, what's in it for me and what does this mean? He longs for us to come and ask that question that's related to the Scriptures. And therefore, he begins by letting the disciples know the control has been restored in full. I have all power and all authority. I can do what I want, when I want to, but there is this plan that my Father has that I will let continue until God may be all in all, like I read last night. The last enemy that God will destroy is death. If you're asking all kinds of questions like, why are we still alive? If Jesus already won victory, why didn't he take us to heaven and be with him? Because there are still souls for his <coughs> suffering that need to be claimed. And you know how the souls are claimed? We go fishing. That's it. What do you mean by we go fishing is probably what you're thinking. So here's point number two. The command is restored about fruit. You remember that in uh, Genesis... God said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Jesus reiterates that command, but he does so in a different way. He says, go and make disciples of all nations. The sickest part of that is, a lot of translations use the word teach. But when the Bible says make disciples of all nations, the word disciple just means student, pupil, or one who learns. All that the Bible is telling us to do is go communicate to other people to be students. That's all. It's saying, be a student of Jesus Christ, understand what he taught, live what he taught, no different than people say you need to go listen to Bruce Lee or anybody else that is a teacher. Ultimately speaking, I think many of us forget that discipleship is a biblical command. This is not an idea that Jesus had in mind that he said, yo, it would be dope if you did this. He's saying, no, it is inherent in being a Christian that you are also a missionary. You have to be sharing the gospel, and if you are not, that is a clear indication that you don't, aren't acquainted with the gospel. You remember I said that about Paul last night, that he said, I committed to you, first of all, that which I also received. In other words, I can't help but share the news because I've received it. I heard a story once of this general who uh, had uh, uh, several uh, troops under his command. Every troop returned but one troop. He had the responsibility then of going to that family and telling that family that their son was dead. When he went to that family, naturally, he didn't want to do it. He had to get in all of his attire. He didn't want to put it on. He did it. He got into his car and he drove as slowly as, slowly as he could to get to those folks' house to tell them that their son was missing in action. He got to the door. He knocked on the door. As the mom comes to the door, he sees the mom comes to the door. She sees him. 
And she begins to understand why he's there. The dad then comes to the door just then. Little kids come up behind them. And he says, I'm sorry to tell you this, Mr. and Mrs. Don't know the last name of this one, you Smith. Your son is missing in action. We don't know if he made it. So we're assuming the worst, that he died. Naturally, mom collapses in father's arms. He spends two hours with that family trying to comfort them in the loss of their son. He gets back to his office. He pulls off all of these stars and stripes and everything that he has. He recognizes that he's communicated this to his family, and a call comes into his line. Naturally, he's a little frustrated because out of all of his troops, one didn't return. <coughs> he gets a call on his line. The call that he gets says... Agent uh, Private Smith is not dead. Not only is he not dead, he's behind enemy lines. Not only is he behind enemy lines, but he has single-handedly captured a bunker, and capturing that bunker ensures that we will win the war. Sir, he's not dead. He's a hero. Yeah. Naturally, as that general hears the news, he doesn't even take the time to put all of his stuff back on because he just can't help but get back to them folks' house. That's all he wants to do. There's nothing else he wants to do, nothing else entering his mind but getting to that house and sharing that good news. So he jumps in his car. Before, he drove as slowly as he could. Now he's driving 90 down the freeway hoping he doesn't get pulled over. He gets to that house, he jumps out of his car, he races to the door, and he tries to beat the door down. As the mom comes to the door, the mom is still, you can see that her eyes have been sobbing for a long, long time, probably since he left. His clothes are in disarray, she opens the door, and she recognizes that there's some other news. So she sees how messed up his clothes are, she doesn't know what that news is, and she fears the worst, that they actually found his body. Before everybody else can even come to the door, he begins to shout at her completely different than he's supposed to, but he's just so excited he can't help it. I want to tell you that your son is not dead. I'm here to give you the good news that your son is not dead. Not only is he not dead, he's behind enemy lines. She looks shocked and she fears the worst. Don't get, don't get discouraged at all. Don't be frustrated by that. I'm telling you that because he's captured a bunch of that ensures we will win the war. Your son is not only not dead, your son is a hero. Yeah. Can't wait to share that news. Now, if you've listened to that, then in the midst of that, you've probably heard the gospel. Yeah. As I look at my life and look at the brokenness of my own life and look at the brokenness of my sin, as I shared the story about sending and my son last night at Idlewild, you have to understand that when you are able to look in the mirror and see the brokenness of your past and the brokenness that you've encountered on a day-to-day -day basis, breaking the heart of God, but you know that his son is not only not dead, he has captured a major bunker, that's my soul that will ensure that I will win the victory yeah. because he's already won it, it's a whole lot easier for me to share that good news and be Excitement. Yeah. But when that's not your life, when you're not constantly acquainted with what Jesus has done and the victory he's won in your life, freeing you from the things that have bound you, and he's freed you from the scandal in Nashville, if, that's, if you understand that terminology, when he's freed you from all these other things, you can <coughs> easily communicate that freedom. Never forget Runday Juicy Hall. I tell the story everywhere I go was my quote-unquote dear friend. He kept the stuff in my locker, bunch because his girlfriend's locker was next to mine. We played basketball from the time that we were 10. Juice grew to be 6'4 in the 10th grade. He was getting letters from UNC and Notre Dame and everywhere else. You can't teach tall. Some of y'all get that. He was a basketball player. Juice, uh, on July 17th, his birthday, he died uh, on his birthday. Got hit by a car and uh, one late night and when we got the call, it came in about 4 in the morning. When it came in, it came from my cousin. And I thought my cousin was a pathological liar. I thought he was pulling a practical joke. I was half asleep anyway. When I woke up the next morning, my mom sat on my bed and was explaining to me how Juice was dead. The only thing I could think about when I found out he was dead is this one scenario in my life. I played basketball with him, spent tons of time with him. He spent tons of time with me. I never once shared the gospel with him. I never once sat him down and said, Juice, let me tell you the most important thing in all of life and in all of death. Never did that one time. There was one particular instance that stood out in my mind. My parents, uh, my dad's a pastor down in Southern Virginia, and we always had this lock-in, and we have bus loads of kids at this lock-in. Never forget it, it was right after the slam dunk contest. It was about 1 a.m. The gospel was going out just like it's going out right now, and I will never forget it. Juice was laying half underneath the bleachers. He was half asleep. He was wearing some black and white Nike flip-flops, white socks, black and white shorts, and a white shirt. 
I couldn't see his head, but he was laying down. And I remember walking past him thinking, I need to wake Juice up to make sure that he hears the gospel. But I don't want him to be mad at me. Mm. Juice was dead two months later. Mm. And for a long time, I carried guilt and shame in my heart thinking, all I needed to do was wake him up. If he didn't believe, that's on him. But I had a clear opportunity to wake him up to make sure he heard the gospel. And I didn't take it because I was afraid that he would be mad at me. And I began to have images in my mind of him in hell, if he is. I don't know if he is. I don't know if he ever believed or not. But I just wonder sometimes if he's in hell going, Pope never said a thing. Mm. Was around him all the time. He became a Christian when he was born. Said he loved Jesus. Went to church all the time. Never said a thing. We was on a basketball court together every day. I went to his locker every day. He never said a thing. But there are some of you who have friends that are the same way. Yeah. They see you go to church. They see you on youth retreats. They know you went to a retreat this weekend. You ain't never said a thing. Mm -hmm. I'm here to tell you that if Jesus means anything to you, this is your opportunity. Because Jesus reiterates the command. Go and make disciples of all nations. Yeah. Then look at what he says. He says, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Why does he say that? He says that for the same reason that I wear a red wedding ring. And all of you who are married understand what a wedding ring symbolizes. Yeah. See, everywhere I go, people know that I'm married because of this ring. Now listen, I can wear this ring and not be married. I cannot wear this ring and still be married. But ultimately, baptism is an outward sign of inward grace. What it communicates to people when you stand up and you are, are willing to symbolize death and resurrection, you're telling people, I identify with Jesus Christ. Yeah. He means more to me than anything else. Been a missionary in, uh, in countries that are predominantly Muslim and Druze. And they won't kill you until you get baptized. Mm -hmm. That's when you begin to get persecuted. Mm -hmm. I begin to ask all of the folks that are there, why is that the case? Listen, listen, listen. These are lost folk. Get it. They said, because if you're willing to take that stand in front of your church, in front of your friends, and in front of your family to say, I'm going to identify with Jesus Christ, that means you're going to be a Christian who does something. Mm -hmm. But if you're not willing to take that pledge, it's no different than a guy who wants to date his girlfriend and not get married. We don't care. You're not serious. But when you take that pledge, when you, take, when you step into that covenant relationship with God where you're willing to let everybody know that this is who you are and how you are, at that moment, we've got an issue with you. Here's the last thing for this morning. The covenant has been restored forever. God has won the victory forever. Look at what he says. Teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you and love and listen, I am with you always, even to the end of this world. What does that mean? At, this, at the most basic level, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, what is called the Shema, it is the greatest thing that any Jew would understand. That is that you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. You're to love your neighbor as yourself. You're to teach the word of God when you sit down, when you rise up, as you walk by the way, when you lie down. All of that is there. That was the process by which God wanted discipleship to happen. Ain't nobody sitting here telling you, you got to go to school, you got to sit somebody down, and you got to teach them every single thing from Genesis 1 1 to Revelation 22, 22 21, all 1189 chapters, all 21,763 verses. Ain't nobody saying you got to do that. What we're saying is you got to walk in somebody's life enough to allow them to recognize what means the most to you. Because when you think about it, isn't that what we do anyway? Mm, come on. We walk alongside people anyway. Tell them what we care about anyway. If they care about it, we share it more and more with them. We have the fellowship of all kind of other things. God was saying, look, as you live, as you go each day, as you continue in your life, all I desire for you is to be teaching them the things that I have taught you. What does Jesus ultimately teach? Loving God the Father. Mm -hmm. Loving your name. Do you notice that all the commandments, the first focus on God, the next focus on your neighbor? And Jesus said that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second one is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Ultimately, that is the focus of all of creation. What does God require of you in Micah <coughs> chapter 6, verses 7 and 8? To love God, to do mercy, and to walk up and with them. I think we make Christianity more complicated than Christianity actually is. Yeah. All God desired from you and for you is relationship. That is what you were made for. But what we tend to do is we, we mistake a pursuit of pleasure for happiness. And in our pursuit of pleasure, we forsake our happiness. We forsake joy. 
And you end up as a person who is dissatisfied with life, looking in the mirror, not knowing who's staring back, and you may end up like I ended up in 2003, desiring, holding two bullets in my hand, desiring to take my own life, because when I looked at my life, I didn't see what the scripture said I was supposed to see. Because, see, I thought Christianity had failed me versus me failing Christianity. I didn't want to put up. I, I didn't want to take the responsibility for making poor decisions. I wanted to put that on God. And I, like God had an issue because of my life was the way that it was. Ultimately speaking, if you don't get anything else I've said this weekend, you need to hear this about legacy. The decisions you make today will determine what kind of parent you are in the future. Listen to me very carefully. Don't nobody wake up at 14 years old and say, in 10 years, I want to be a daddy daddy. That's my goal in life. <laughs> I ain't never met a girl who said, by age 19, I want to have four kids out of wedlock by four different daddies. Never heard that happen. I have never had somebody walk up to me and go, yo, when I'm like 18, I want to be on death row and like have killed 17 people in 19 different ways. Very few people call that. I never forget this. I'm going to tell this last story when I'm done. I was in Pittsburgh. I was there for a meeting. I went and parked in front of my friend's building. What I did not know is I had also parked right in front of an Allegheny County jail. When I came back to my car, I was wearing this nice cream suit, blue shirt, gold tie. Looked really sharp. And when I got to my car, there was this dude standing next to my car in the middle of Pittsburgh, downtown. I get into my car. As I'm getting into my car, hey, man, hey, man, I need some money. And I said, I, I'm sorry, sir, I don't carry cash because I don't. And I didn't have it. I said, I can't really help you. He said, look, man, I just need $2 to get to the bus station. Can you help me get to the bus station? I said, I can take you to the bus station, but I'm, I'm sorry, sir, I can't give you any money. I said, where are you from? He said, I'm from Swissvale. Swissvale is just... Uh, on the eastern side of Pittsburgh. And I said, cool, uh, if you want, I can take you to Swiss Bell. I'm going that way anyway. He was like, no, 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 man, I just need money for the bus. At that moment, I knew, bro, you don't need money. You're trying to get something else. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing down here? Man, I just got out of prison. That's when I recognized where I was. So I say, hey, dude, let me take you where you need to go. He gets in my car. I am not kidding, not lying, not joking. A girl who looks like a crackhead is sitting there rubbing her arms on the side, sees him get into my car, runs up to my car, and asks me for a ride. I go, this is straight out of a movie. I'm about to get killed or worse. But I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying, no, this is what I have for you today. So I get this boy in my car, I get this girl in my car, both of them look 40. I find out that the boy is 23, the girl is 20. Oh. The girl is 21, looks 40, has four kids out of wedlock. The boy, don't remember if he had kids, but he just got out of prison for not having his license and driving through Pittsburgh. Whose car were you driving, sir? Because you don't have a ride right now. Oh, I'm driving my girlfriend's car. What happened to the car? Was it impounded? Yeah. Are you going to get it out? Well, I don't know. Well, shouldn't you be asking money for that <laughs> before you? Mm -hmm. So he told me he was from Swissville. I said I was going that way. When he got into my car, the story changed. Mm -hmm. He said, well, I'm actually from Butler. Mm. Butler is 40 miles west of Pittsburgh. Mm. Immediately, Holy Spirit calms my heart because I wanted to choke him, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Begin to ask his life story, been in and out of jail. Begin to ask her life story, been in and out of jail, on drugs. I said, how did you guys get to where you got? You know what the answer is? I don't know. I said, if you would allow me to, I can answer your question for you. I said, you got that one line of time. Mm -hmm. It didn't take long. You snuck out of the house as a child. I began to tell them their life without ever hearing it. Mm -hmm. And they just looked at me like, how in the world do you know this? Because that's the human experience. One lie at a time. You get molested, you don't tell anybody. One lie at a time. Some brokenness comes into your life. You have sex before marriage. You don't want to tell anybody because you're completely ashamed. One lie at a time. Come on. Before you know it, you're 21. You got three kids out of wedlock. You're on drugs. You're getting in and out of jail. And you're like, how in the world did my life get like this? One lie at a time. There are some of you that are sitting in here right now that would love nothing more 
than to go home and to live this thing out the way you know God wants you to. You got one of two options. You can end with the beginning in mind, the next step that you need to take in order to get where you want to go, in order to be the man of God or the woman of God that God wants you to be. Or you can take this opportunity and you can have a one night stand with Jesus. You can say that was dope. Love the worship, love having fun, love playing around, but that's just a whole nother thing in my life. You can compartmentalize and become a one way at church and one way at school and one way at home and be a whole different person when you look in the mirror. That's what I did until the Lord put my life in shambles and there was absolutely nothing else I could do because I looked up at a fiance who was sleeping with my brother. And I recognized that my life was not the life, and I was a youth pastor at the time, my life wasn't the life that I had always envisioned. And when God allowed my life to be completely ruined, like I told you last night, I recognized that there was nothing I had in life but Jesus. Yeah. I told you that was the last story. i got to say this last thing. Any man who has God plus anything has nothing more than a man who has God alone. God brought me to that reality. A man who has God plus a great job, plus a great house, plus a great wife, plus great kids and all of that stuff has nothing more than a man who has God alone. When Jesus becomes your everything, yeah. Jesus becomes your all in all. He all I got. If God takes everything else from me, all I got is him. And that has to be enough. Come on. If you're not at that place where you can say that, and as I shared with somebody last night, God might have to break you until you get there. He's the only person I know, though, who won't use something until it's broken. Mm. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you allow us to recognize that your covenant has been renewed forever, that you, just like when you fed the 5,000, you blessed the bread, you broke it, you gave it, and it was overflowing. 